This episode of the Agile Uprising podcast is brought to you by vGroup Digital. vGroup Digital provides native cloud-based software development services on iOS, Android, web, Mac, and Windows, as well as enterprise product development, maintenance, and support. vGroup Digital is led by a team of agile practitioners who believe in collaboration, constant feedback, and delivering the highest value at all times. Visit www.vgroupdigital.com for more info and mention the Agile Uprising podcast to get up to 15% off all development services. This is the Agile Uprising podcast. So I want to welcome everyone to another Agile Uprising podcast. Tonight, we are lucky enough to have a great group of Agile practitioners. Tonight, we're going to be discussing women in the lean Agile universe. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to have our guests tonight go ahead and introduce themselves. So why don't we go ahead and start with Lisa? Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. I'm Lisa Crispin, and I've been in the software business since the early 80s when there were just as many women as men. So it's been an interesting journey for me as I've moved through different teams and found fewer and fewer women. Um, but I'm really excited to to have an event like this, a podcast like this. Um, back in 2010, Mike Sutton and I did a Women in Agile project for the Agile Alliance where we just interviewed women. Uh, in Agile, and it's super great to be able to just have a podcast and have this discussion. I'm really seeing a lot of changes, so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So next, uh, why don't, Colleen, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of info about yourself? Okay. Uh, my name is Colleen Johnson, and I'm the Lean and Agile Practice Director for ImagineX Consulting. Um, I focus a lot of my efforts there on teaching Kanban and helping organizations scale Kanban to the enterprise. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Scatterspoke.com, which is a tool for um, online distributed retrospectives. Um, and I've been in the software world for about 15 years. So I have probably a very different lens than Lisa, and I'm excited to hear a lot about what what her experiences were like before and now and, and everybody in this podcast. I think this discussion is a great one and one that um, everybody can bring a lot of different experiences to, to the table to share. Great. Thanks, Colleen. Um, Janice, why don't you go ahead and give us an introduction? Sure. Uh, I'm Janice Linden-Reed, and I'm the CEO of Lean Kanban Incorporated. So uh, I run the training program, the events, the publishing, uh, a bunch of different aspects of the uh, Kanban market. And uh, I have also been in the software industry since the mid-80s, and I got into Agile in 2008. Um, I've had many experiences where I've been the only woman uh, working at a, uh, in an office. Um, so I'm uh, interested. That in um, very interested in this in this topic, I tend to be a dissenter on the whole um, um, women in blank uh, groups. So uh, I'm very interested to uh, hear what everyone has to say. Great. And Becky, how about a <clears throat> quick introduction? Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, my name is Becky Hartman, and I'm an Agile coach at Agile Thought in Tampa, Florida. And I've been probably in the software space for maybe only three to four years. And before that was um, in IT, in infrastructure and, um, and project management. Um, I came up in kind of the PMP world and migrated over uh, with the ACP on through with um, some other certifications. Kind of felt like a real natural progression uh, for me um, from maybe... <laughs> Maybe like I could breathe out, like I had a team with me instead of I was the one who was responsible for everything that was going on. Um, and recently, I've actually, this this last year with uh, two other partners, been speaking on the topic, and we actually spoke for PMI on women in project management, but we took it 
around a couple of venues. Um, and so it was kind of a women in, um, you know, fill, fill in the blank, kind of as Janice said. Um, and really, we talked from an aspect of, we know there are aspects that are definitely unfair, but we talked about kind of where we limit ourselves and how we can improve ourselves and, and help ourselves more in ways that benefit us. So I'm very interested in this topic and this conversation as well. So that's great. Thank, thanks, everyone, again, for, for joining. So I think that's, that's an interesting sort of segue in, into the conversation, Becky. So how has your journey taken you since you've started till now? Sort of what areas or, or what contributions do you see that have helped, that have been challenging? So walk us through, if someone wants to go ahead and, and sort of walk us through how that journey has has progressed and sort of some of the interesting facts about it. Well, this is Lisa. I think one interesting thing is what we didn't know that went on before. I've just recently read some books about women who were pioneers in programming back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And it's really great that somebody thought to write about these women who worked at at universities or at NASA or Jet Propulsion Laboratory, different different places where computing was uh, started to be used for something practical. And I wonder sometimes when I was growing up in the 60s, what would, what would my decisions have been about what I wanted to do if I'd have known about those women? Because I totally fell into the software industry in the 80s. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, so there were wonderful women who went before us. Um, uh, and I puzzled over why there were so many women when I started working in software and, and then the, by the end of the century, so few. Uh, and unfortunately, I think some of it is because computing originally was low status work. The hardware was the sexy thing and the software was just manipulating a bunch of relays and stuff a lot of manual grunt work and that was that was low paid and so that was for women and when the software got more important and it got higher paid um apparently i mean i'm sure there are lots of reasons they're very complex but definitely there was some reason that women were edged out and more men got in so um so it's just over time that happened but i really have seen huge changes recently in reversing that trend so that's that's quite heartening this is Colleen. I was going to say that um, one of the things that I think has been fairly interesting, I think um, I haven't been in the software world as, as long as some of the amazing people on the podcast with us, but um, I think one of the things that I found challenging in my career was when I started to start a family. Um, and I think there, there's definitely, you know, a, a, a disconnect between a number of men and the number of women in software now, but I felt it a lot. I felt a lot harder struggles um, personally, once I was once I was a mother and trying to deal with being a consultant who was trying to pump in random places and random offices I had never been to, and, um, <laughs> oh I think I started feeling a yeah. That's I think that's when I I never felt like I um, was put in a different position because I was a woman or couldn't advance my career the way I wanted to because I was a woman. I I, I actually feel like I've had a lot of amazing opportunities and have have been given a great seat at the table when I want it. Um, but I felt that I felt like it was hard with with um, being a mother in some of those environments and having to deal with, you know, leaving to pick up a sick kid. And that wasn't something that I felt like a lot of my male counterparts had to deal with. Colleen, I wondered about that, too, because, for example, I, I'm a tester on the Pivotal Tracker team at, at Pivotal. And one of the things about Pivotal, because they pair program all the time, everybody works the same hours and there's not the flexibility that I've had at other companies. And I, I, w I would just would expect that that would affect a lot of women who had families or had maybe had parents to take care of whatever. Do you feel like that that is maybe one of the factors that comes in for women? Um, well, and I was just going to say, so, I mean, there's, there's all, there's all kinds of data out there um, and definitely blog posts in different cases where, Women have experienced that in, in more subtle and nuanced ways, not necessarily outright stated, but in, in the ways like if you typically, the whole crew is there at the same time, um, like you're saying, uh, Lisa, or, you know, Colleen, when you feel like there's pressure there. I mean, certainly I felt the same thing. I had a daughter who had many allergies when she was young, and there was two weeks 
the first time we discovered where I left almost every other day to have to pick her up from school. And I really felt a lot of pressure um, from my manager just to like, I need you back here as quick as I can, you know, subtle things like that, that really make you nervous, especially as a, as a single parent, which I was then um, to, to kind of comply with that. It always seems to be, and I guess I shouldn't say always in a lot of cases that, you know, the, the traditional roles play out and mom, you know, typically take the brunt of those kinds of things, you know, even, even in a, a normal household. Right. So um, there's definitely statistics that point to that. And even more so that both men and women are harder on women. And even when there was a, a survey done uh, through one of the project managers, who's very active in the PMI community, um, that both men and women see men as more dedicated to their roles specifically in project management and but it does tend to trend across other industries so it's like if women kind of feel the way that we feel and also there's a perception that maybe men are more dedicated that's quite a nuance to be had in any industry definitely and i would agree with what you said i mean i think sometimes that we're we are the hardest on ourselves, right? Um, like you said about feeling guilty, about feeling like you have to leave or, or have to, to go mm-hmm. take care of kids. Um, I definitely can, that resonates strongly with me because I think sometimes, you know, even if everybody said it was fine and it wasn't a big deal, I was beating myself up probably more than I needed to. Oh, um, absolutely. About not being as present. Yeah. yeah. Janice, do you have anything you'd like to add or... Um, just, you know, my mother was a professional kind of in uh, journalism and I sort of saw her go through all of this, um, you know, get a lot of, get hassled a lot at her job for leaving to take care of her kids and all that. And I don't know, it, it hasn't really been a big issue for me for various reasons. And I, I feel like I don't have a lot of stories to tell about that. Um, I do have a daughter, but, um, that I've always, maybe always been careful to structure my life so I have a lot of either part-time or flexible situations Um, but I totally agree that women are really hard on other women and um, by the same token they're really hard on themselves Mm -hmm. and I find that that comes up again and again. That is the topic that seems to come up like over and over and over again um, with colleagues. Um, I was actually really fortunate enough to just be in St. Louis this past weekend at the ACCUS, the Agile um, Coaches Camp in the U.S., and we did, um, we convened a session on women in Agile, and there were maybe only five of us there um, talking, but, you know, that's one thing that came up over and over is what do we see and how do we feel we can help each other with those kinds of things because we are so hard on ourselves we don't we innately and I guess there are probably statistics out there about this too like women don't tend to apply for jobs unless they feel they really have almost all of the qualifications which if you know you're looking at job postings is almost impossible for any human to have all of those qualifications whereas our male counterparts will apply with far less you know um assurance that they have those skills. I mean, it goes on and on the kinds of things that, that we self impose upon ourselves, the rules that we play by or how we consider ourselves worthy or not worthy of things. Um, And, you know, really for me, building a strong network and having people give me honest feedback has really been key to kind of telling me I'm full of it (laughs) when I need to kind of stop it right or or be encouraging to myself be my own best friend or have a best friend to help me out with some of those topics this is lisa i like to point out it's not just women who are hard on women everybody's hard on women and i don't have the research right in front of me but there are very solid uh scientific studies that show that i don't remember the exact number but in terms of performance evaluations something like 85 percent of women have had a negative something negative on their performance evaluation, guess what the mm-hmm. percentages of men, it's something like 5%. And we wow. wonder why women don't rise up through the levels of the organization. That's just a small example. There's a lot of solid research out there. But, you know, it's a real thing. And it's not just us being hard on us. <laughs> we shouldn't blame ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of cultural stuff to work against. So Very has, true. I, I it, agree with that. Have you had any success in, in sort of, combating some of that behavior? 
Well, um, since I work with events and I do, I organize events and I'll run, I'll, you know, I'm a program chair sometimes. Um, and I've, I've learned that you actually have to explicitly invite um, women who uh, could potentially be a good speaker. Um, if, if I hit, say, if I'm running a training class and a woman talks about her um, work situation and it's really interesting and really compelling and she has really great experience, I find that I actually have to go up and, you know, and see, even if I had already said, look, we're, we're looking for speakers, you know, to the whole class, I'll find that I, I literally have to go up to the woman and say, hey, I think you have really something to say, something to contribute, and you should apply, and then follow up with that person. And I really don't do that because it's a woman, um, just because, you know, oh, I want more women at the event. I do it because I feel they actually do have something to contribute, and if I don't invite them explicitly, they, it doesn't even occur to them. I mean, that's what they say all the time to me. They're like, I never would have thought of it. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, it's something as simple as that. Invitation makes a big difference, and um, there, there's definitely a lot to be said about kind of shifting that focus and giving people a different filter to look through, envisioning themselves that way, um, as, you, as you said. Um, one of the things that I've recently um, read about um, made complete sense and actually um, ha had the experience just today was that Sometimes when women speak, again, as, as we pointed out, women and men are both harder on women. Sometimes thoughts aren't heard. You feel like things are glossed over. Um, they attribute it more to when women are speaking in a group where there are, you know, maybe equal male to female or predominantly male where the idea is, is brushed over. And then a few minutes later, somebody else says the idea uh, and, and the idea is attributed to that other person. Um, and recently there was an article that came out on Vox.com about the Obama White House and how even though he, he definitely leans in favor and has made great strides in having more women in his White House and in his cabinet, the women were still experiencing that phenomenon and they began doing something they called amplification, which is where when one woman speaks and says an idea, if the idea isn't validated or acknowledged, another woman will repeat the idea and attribute it to the, to the woman who initiated the conversation or the idea um, to make sure that there's some um, confirmation of that statement um, and experienced it just today in a meeting that we were having, you know, mixed both male and women, um, and it did work. I mean, it was good. It kind of felt like there'd been no recognition of it, and then when the second person said it, there was recognition. I don't think it's necessarily an intentional thing at all. And I think to some extent, maybe everyone experiences it, but they do, they have, again, done the studies that women statistically experience it far more than men. And I think that's a good way to do it. Uh, it's also letting someone know that you've heard them if you're amplifying what they've said. It's a really good tool for communication, use it in mirroring and all of those things. So it's good all around as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that. I, I love that I've been learning a lot of techniques of, you know, good communication and, and that was just an awesome one. Um, and I think also, you know, women are more likely to come in when they see more women. So I know a few mm -hmm. companies that have a lot, for example, have a lot of women developers. Well, once you have a lot of women developers, let's say you have at least a third, if you bring in a new interview candidate and they look around and they're like, wow, I, I see myself here then they're much more likely to, to consider that employer. Um, today I learned that uh, ThoughtWorks was uh, given an award at the Grace Hopper Conference because they actually have more women than men at a, at a tech company. Woo! And I'm sure that, you know, I think once you get to a critical mass of women, it's a lot easier because we can see ourselves. It's like, wow, I can imagine being there because I can see myself. So I think it is important to bring in more women. And I've had similar experiences to Janice. I... I help, I've helped organize a lot of conferences over the years, and I'll, I'll often ask a woman I know, say, wow, would you consider proposing to this conference because you have some great experiences? And she'll say, well, you know, there's nothing I do that, that other people don't do. There's nothing I know that other right. people don't know. And, and say, so, well, but, but your experience is unique. And one thing that I've done personally is I've 
the last couple of years, all of my conference sessions have been pairing with other women as well, not yes. always women, new speakers. Sometimes I can't find, I still can't find a woman to, to present with me. So, okay. A guy is okay. But, um, but just to give them the experience, because once they've, they've done it, it builds their confidence. It makes them more likely to be accepted at another conference. And uh, we have the Speakeasy organization doing that kind of mentoring for, for new women speakers. And, and, and again, if we see ourselves at tech conferences, we're more likely to speak. We're more likely to participate. So I think all these efforts are really contributing to, to helping us see ourselves in this context so that we want to join in. And I think one of the things that you just touched on, Lisa, that, that's kind of interesting too, and, and Janice, the same thing about inviting the speakers, is I think because there is such an effort right now to bring more women into to not just Agile, but technology in general, I think it does make you sometimes question why you're there, right? And And the uncomfortable part can be, I think that that puts a lot of women, and I would put myself in this boat, in, a, in the position where you feel like you have to prove why you got that spot to speak or that seat at the table or or a voice in the conversation because you're not sure if it's because there's, there's, are we trying to balance out the number of women or are we trying to make sure, you know, did you earn your, did you earn your seat with your credentials? And so I think that environment you described where there's more, there's more women than women developers than, than male developers. That's probably a great environment where you feel like you don't have to come in with your, you know, with your fists up to prove, prove yourself and, and prove yourself as being the only woman developer, you, you earned your spot and you know you're there because you're a great, you're great at what you do. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've obviously had those experiences even not long ago of, of being told, like openly, like you're being invited to speak because you're a woman. And, you know, and we're trying to get more women at this event. And I'm just like, wow, I'm, I know I'm really qualified. I know I've done a lot of public speaking. So, Really, that's why I'm being invited. And uh, we're seeing some very disturbing trends uh, around that where men are, are sort of, I mean, really sort of patting themselves back for how, you know, socially responsible they are for going around doing this positive discrimination. And it's, it's um, you know, I really do have a problem with that. I mean, even with, you know, Lisa, what you were saying about ThoughtWorks, uh, giving an award or being given an award for having more female um, developers, it's like, uh, you know, part of me is like, why? You know, why is that? Even though I know the reality, the reality is they probably right. had to overcome a lot of opposition, whatever, to be, you know, even within their organization for to achieve that. But but just on the face of it, why is it better? To well, have the, more, the, award was, the award was being a great place to work if you are a woman, but but mm-hmm. the the fact that they have more women than men probably contributes to that for sure. Well, yes. And my understanding is that they do, and I may be totally wrong with this. I don't work for that works, but I, I do believe that they make a special effort to like, let's try to hire as many women as men, but that doesn't mean that they lower their standards. So they're very careful. They have a quite a, they have quite an interesting hiring process and a quite a, quite a, a high standard. So I don't think they're lowering their standards to fill in women. But, you know, at the same yeah. time, there are times that I think, why am I working so hard to get women to conferences and things and, and working in software companies? Because I hear horrible, horrible, horrible stories even today. I hear yeah. of women, even women close to my age, being hounded out of jobs at tech companies unfairly, being just abused by men. I hear of women at conferences being attacked at the end of the evening when they walk back to their hotel by men who have clearly waited at the exit to the conference event to prey on these women. This just isn't okay. And, and should I be trying to get more women to join in this? And I, you know, so I'm working really hard at getting conference organizers aware of this and, and yeah. working on codes of conduct and working on to keep everybody at a conference safe, but yeah, it's it's a real dilemma because this, this one at the one hand, it's like wow, I love this business, I want more women here, and the other hand, it's like okay, these women had a horrible experience. Do I want to lure someone else into that horrible experience? Right, and that this is a, a great point is that uh, I've been telling people is like how co- how about before we bring a bunch more women in, we work more on how we're treating the women who are already 
everybody here because this whole yeah. thing of, you know, interrupt people, talking over people, taking credit for people's ideas, you know, all that, that women, you know, I, it happens to me, it happens to other women that I see, um, it, you know, it, I really think people should address that first. I'm not a fan of the code of conduct um, because, uh, you know, okay, let's say someone's being attacked outside of you know, a conference venue or something like that, is a code of conduct going to make a difference there? You know, I mean, is it, is it going to, I mean, wouldn't you throw those people out anyway? Um, but, it, you know, there's, there's um, just, uh, it, you know, it's complicated. And I think if we can just start by supporting women that are in our community, making sure they're being treated well and, and making it a, a more appealing place, um, it, you know, what I'm, what I'm also seeing are women who are um, actually leveraging this positive discrimination trend to um, get status such as speaking positions that they do not deserve. Uh, and that that's, I think, really, really disturbing. Even more disturbing than that, I see men bringing women in in the name of having more diversity and and then, you know, it, I don't know, their, their motives are suspect as well. So um, yeah. it, it's incredibly complicated. People want to make it this flippant thing. I'm not saying any of you are doing this, but I'm saying that, that I hear this, especially from men in the community that like, oh, yeah, just bring in more women. Why aren't there more women? What's the problem? And yeah. it's not that simple. Yeah. And, and, and quite often, right? Because human, nothing is ever quite that simple as we <laughs> want it to be. Um, so I, I just wonder, Janice, do you, do you have I, uh, leading ideas or, or maybe larger ideas? I know they're still complex, but I'm really interested because clearly you, you, you've seen this a lot. I've not had the experience of um, really applying much and speaking at conferences yet. Um, I was just very fortunate to have someone offer to share their speaking position with me at a conference that's coming up in November. Um, and I'm working my best to take advantage of that because she's mentoring me through that. But do you have other ideas on how we can help to, like like you said, maybe not pull more folks in at this moment, but help to make it more safe and, and the things that we can do there as a, as a group? Yeah, I mean, the experiment that I'm looking to try, I have not actually kicked it off, but I'm hoping to um, this month, is um, having a, a, maybe not even a women-only group but a um you know a some kind of a private online group that's a friendly audience where you can take your intellectual property such as uh, articles that you've written or presentations that you've put together whatever and you could you know circulate those for feedback um because i want to the other thing is i want to make sure that women have very strong content because it's not doing any you know, women any favors, if they're putting women, uh, you know, on a stage or publishing women's work, if it's, if it's weak. And um, right. sometimes just partly through lack of practice or lack of experience or, or whatever it is, uh, it can be um, weak. So I, I don't like that I I'll look at a conference program and see a bunch of soft um, uh, presentations that are all the women's presentations. I mean, I just think that's sort of sending the wrong signal. Um, so I really think if we can help those of us who are more experienced can work with these women and uh, that are newer to it and help them develop their ideas and develop their confidence, then um, mm -hmm. hopefully that would that would help. Yeah, I've I've seen real results from the Speakeasy program on that. That they're you know they're we have mentors who work with people they work with conference organizers to say you know will you take a couple of our uh, our mentees uh to speak and knowing that they'll have an experienced mentor helping them and that's been working out great they've had they we've got speakeasy has gotten women uh, speaking at conferences and the evaluations have on them have been great and they've been going on to doing other conference presentations and some of them even, even getting into, you know, keynoting and things like that. So, but that's because they have this support behind them. So I, I agree. It's like, we have to make sure that we're, it's not tokenism. It's people are, these women are really contributing value. 
Yeah, that's a great word for it, Lisa. I think that tokenism is what none of us, you know, none of us want to be on the other side of that either. Um, and I think I, I also participate in a handful of women, women in whatever groups. And, and one of my favorites is the women who start up group. Um, and that one I really find is, is kind of what you're describing, Janice, and just trying to create a really safe place for people to share ideas, to share their failures, um, to ask people to, you know, will you help me review my resume? I'm about to go interview for this job. Um, there are men on there. Men are, it's open to men, but it is mostly women. And I feel like it's just a very um, friendly space and safe place for everybody to just kind of get that feedback and mentorship in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I, I, I really enjoy that part of it because it doesn't feel like every, anybody's in there looking, you know, looking for a handout or looking for something special because they're a woman. It's just an, a way to network and mentor each other. I think uh, having, having that kind of uh, uh, support is really, um, is really powerful. But um, also, though, I really would like to see women step up uh, and, and be a little bit braver. I mean, I've had a lot of women say, oh, I would never talk on that discussion forum because, you know, people always get into these big debates or people always get into these, you know, I don't, I don't want to actually, you know, argue or defend my position. And, and I, I get that, that men see argument as sort of a sport. Um, yeah. You know, there have been <laughs> studies on that, that men will actually take a position that they don't even hold for the enjoyment of the debate. Um, and, w and women t often don't like to do that. And I'm curious to know if for all of you all, you know, I know for me, I'm not afraid, you know, I'll get right out there. And if, you know, often, okay, often it isn't the response I want. I mean, maybe it, it isn't as supportive or it's, or, or, or I get ignored or something like that. But, but I, I wonder if, if the women in our unity um, who've been around for a while, uh, are they maybe a little more assertive that way? This is Becky. Um, I know. I know. For me, um, it would depend on the topic. Um, certainly, I am a lot stronger as I've gotten older and further along in my career to say, you know, I'd like to challenge that, or I really don't agree with that statement, and you know, try to negotiate. I like good debate. Um, and, and the team I'm on now, we have a lot of good debate and a lot of challenges um, when, when we talk things through. And I think that we handle that conflict um, really well. Um, I, I also know that in certain forums, I would probably stay quieter. And that may sometimes it has to do with just not feeling like I'm well informed and therefore don't feel like I really have an argument to make, even if I don't really don't like what somebody else is saying. Um, but I will admit that there are times where I don't enter into because I don't want to draw down the ire, right? I see many <laughs> of the women that I follow on Twitter that, and, and even if they're not in a debate or simply if they disagree, man, the trolls are horrible. And mm -hmm. there's a certain line that that crosses that makes me feel very unsafe for them. So at those points, I won't enter into those kinds of debates. So, so do you guys see any difference in the agile community with the sort of with some of these obstacles that you're discussing? Is there a different lens within the agile community because of the promotion of collaboration and so forth? Do you feel there's any sort of there's a different perception or acceptance? Well, this is Lisa. Personally, I I have seen a big difference um, as a tester. Well, I. I've been in a lot of roles over the years, but the testing community back in the early to mid nineties, uh, and even today, there's a certain you know there's a certain amount of there are certain people in that community who, in my opinion, are are bullying women, and I do not I have not experienced that in the agile community. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I just personally haven't experienced it. I feel like from the First time I joined an extreme programming team back in 2000, it was an extremely welcoming and, and as you say, collaborative community. And I, I think, yeah, when you have a community based on values of collaboration and feedback and people are the most important thing, I think that's going to have an impact. And, and I hope we can get away from the label of agile and say that's just the way we should develop software. 
But unfortunately, when you're talking about people writing books or presenting at conferences, some people do develop an ego. And unfortunately, some of those leaders, um, in my opinion, uh, what I've seen is that they, whatever for whatever reason, are extremely hard on the women. And I don't like to see that, but I, I personally haven't seen that in the Agile community. Again, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I do feel like we're, that's what attracted me to Agile. It's about the people and enabling people to do their best work, all people, <laughs> including women. Yeah. And that's, that's really been great for me. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that, Lisa. And, and I have seen a, a few that I think probably hit uh, celebrity status in our community that um, I've, you know, I've seen some tweets and heard some things, but by and large, I have a very large group of what I consider um, male colleagues that I know um, I'm safe with. And I know that they promote the values of, for instance, say we're in a conference situation, they want to, you know, there was a group of men talking this year um, at the Agile Alliance. Um, conference that we're talking about, you know, how do we promote not to, not to show women that they're safe with us necessarily. There's a lot of women here who support women and there's some safe space, but how do we kind of without having to say to other guys, look, we don't condone those kinds of behaviors. Like, is there a button? Is there a symbol? And there was a great conversation between, um, you know, s several male colleagues that talked about you know, making sure that they let other men know that there is a certain standard of behavior they expect at conferences and around everyone and even more specifically like unacceptable conference behaviors for males towards women. And I was, I was really, really heartened and thrilled to hear that it wasn't a, not my problem because I'm not a female, <laughs> like my problem because I'm a human and this is my community, right? Yeah, I find that the Agile community, in my experience, has been very warm toward women that, um, and, and um, you know, like Lisa said, very sort of people and team uh, based. Um, the, the lean community, it, you know, it's also very people oriented, but it's, um, uh, it's very intense in terms of being very, um, you know, everything's very data driven and very, um, you know, scientific method and every, you know, like that it's, there's, yeah. um, it's it, less of the warm fuzzies. Um, and um, I, I, it isn't that it's been more hostile to women, but it's not been as open arms, you know, let's all hang out on the couch together kind of happy um, experience that I've had with the agile community. Yeah. I, I feel like I've kind of had my a foot in either world for, for a good part of my career now. And, um, I would definitely agree. And I think that, you know, some of what you talked about with um, an openness for debate and for conversation, I think some of that breaks down a little bit and some of the stuff in the, in the lean community because it is more data driven and, and, and a lot of people view those conversations as a more black and white topic. Yes. You know, you're right or you're wrong and yeah. there's nothing in the middle. So I think in general, yeah. some of those debates do get a little more heated and intense. And there is more of a reluctance to put things out there from, from not just females, males too. I think that that's not a gender oh, yeah, thing. It's yeah, more that's of true. the yeah. nature of some of the debate topics. Um, I, I, you know, I feel like I've seen some of the stuff we're talking about with conference behavior at, at all different types of conferences, you know, regardless of, of the, the topic or the, um, you know, which side of the agile community it's in. Um, and I think what Becky described is really, really inspiring. I mean, I think it's very cool. I think, you know, one of the, the speakers who was at GlueCon in Colorado last year, Mary Scatton from, um, from Salesforce, talked about how, you know, um, we, we keep having the same conversation, but we, like, we have to get everybody involved in it. So all the stuff we're talking about with having great mentors is, is not just women mentoring women on how to put together a great conference proposal or write a great book or, um, you know, to deliver a great keynote. It's, it's everyone in the community helping mentor women so, so that they're confident that they're delivering great, you know, great content and a message that's on point. Just, you know, just to take this to an extreme, um, the, um, the, you know, you, there's also, 
So this whole issue of how at conferences now, a lot of times in these codes of conduct, they talk about how, well, there shouldn't be um, sexualized imagery or sexualized clothing or there shouldn't be booth babes. And it, and it really, um, I think, starts getting into conflict with the whole um, sort of slut shaming uh, and women owning their own sexuality. Um, so I think... Um, you know, it's interesting where this can all go. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I guess it's much of it is uh, context. Now, I'm, I've been guilty of that myself. I was at a conference several years ago where at the, the speaker dinner the night before the conference started, I saw a woman who was, I thought, quite provocatively dressed. And I, I just, this is terrible, but I just assumed she was just the date or the wife or whatever. Right of one of the attendees. And so then the next day at the conference, I saw a, a topic that I thought sounded really, really great. And so I, I went to the room where the topic was and here was that same woman. She was a speaker and still dressed yep. provocatively. And, uh, and I thought, well, I can't imagine that she can deliver a good talk on this in the time slot she has allowed. And I mean, she just blew me away. And <laughs> she also made all the men in the room extremely uncomfortable. And that was a good lesson on my own judge, you know, you know, leaning to judge people for their cover or whatever. Of course, she should dress how she yeah. wants to dress. And yeah. she, she is an incredibly smart woman who knows what she's talking about. And, uh, and that's a good lesson to all of us. And, and so, yeah, it shouldn't matter how, how people look or, yeah. or how they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, I agree with you. And, and, you know, Part of it is that it's kind of what's been built into the DNA of how we view things. Again, men and women are both harder on women. Mm -hmm. like, you, like we've discussed multiple times now, the double blind studies are out there that prove it. And, you know, I really, once I read that, I actually read that for the first time, though, that the study existed before Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. But I read it in her book. And I've spent a good couple of years, like, even if I have a reaction, like, I really try to check myself, like, what is that about? Like, are you being unfair? Is that because we've so learned to judge? And I, I know to some extent, because human people do that, but, but women have a very special way <laughs> of judging themselves and each other, right? Mm -hmm. Based on appearances and making those assumptions. And I'm sure men make those assumptions too, but it kind of, it's kind of like been turned into almost this, um, silent cat fight, if you will, in certain scenarios. And I've learned a lot from my reactions, just like you're saying that, that you did, um, that really have, you know, I've had some preconceived notions that have surely um, bitten me in the ass before. And, and sometimes that's how we learn, but I hope I don't forget, right? Because I'm thinking if I'm doing that to someone else, someone else is doing it to me. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to lose opportunities or miss the opportunity to learn from somebody else or contribute or mentor or be mentored, you know, because of that, right? I don't want to isolate myself or someone else. Right. So you, you guys are all bringing up really, it, it all seems to be stemming around value, these core values. I actually like the way you said that, Lisa, when, when you were talking earlier. How, how do, you know, within the sphere of control or, or however you want to phrase it, how, how do you sort of enforce that or you know pollinate that that we should be focusing on values and and less around some of these other obstacles that we have how do we promote sort of getting that out there and and as as sort of individuals in this industry how do you empower and promote this for the next wave so that maybe you can alleviate some of these challenges for for females or women coming into this and, and sort of starting out, what, what sort of guidance can you provide that would give sort of the next wave a, more tools in their toolkit? I think we have to have certain standards. We're all professionals here. And um, I think that, it, you know, if the more we can do with promoting our work as uh, management science, um, and really making that clear to men and women that that's really what we want to see, then uh, I think that's, you know, that's a, a good place to start. It's like, let's, let's stay true to the work. Let's stay true to customer value. 
And then to add to that, right, the the, the values of, you know, pr promoting, you know, knowledge work, right? That's what we're talking about when we're saying having, you know, having strong content, having a, a, a strong way to present, you know, th that mentoring piece and that learning, I mean, that's that volunteer um, feeling idea, giving back to the community is something that's really present in the agile community. But I think it's also something really present. I mean, you hear it present in all of us, but that's what we think helps. I'm sure we all have stories of those who have helped us and those who we've helped. And I think um, continuing to be that kind of mentor and volunteer, you know, kind of modeling that behavior. And it's definitely one of those um, topics and behaviors that I personally have no problem getting into the debate about. You know, we were talking about that intense debate and speaking up. This is the thing to speak up about, right? Is to be helpful and to help promote, propel people forward and, you know, let people know that you don't believe that holding people back um, for whatever reason is the right thing to do. Right. I think if we continue to talk about those things and promote those things through our behaviors, but that really helps, you know, the, the next wave, as you've said, Andrew, to, to continue. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this is up to the leadership of today's tech companies. Um, women are, are historically shunted off into, uh, you know, the the pink collar executive jobs or the uh, the glass cliff Oh, yeah, we'll give a woman an executive position, but it's going to be one where she's surely to fail because it's an impossible project. Unfortunately, again, there, there are scientific studies that shows that goes on. And, um, I, you know, I mentioned ThoughtWorks earlier. They have a, a, a woman CTO. I think that's not, not a coincidence. So I really feel like companies, yeah. I know they're all well-intentioned, and but I think until we see women at the executive level in tech companies, it's going to be harder to bring women in. And if we could see more women at the executive level, that's going to just percolate all down through the uh, organizations and make us all feel safer to be women working in the software uh, industry. So I'm hoping, I really am hoping we're going to see more of that because I, I think it's a component. I think we can all help each other. Uh, supporting each other is incredibly helpful. And I'm a member of some some uh, support groups where you know women in testing, chatting online, whatever. It's very helpful to me. That's a that's one side of it. But we also have to see the leadership of companies also take their side. Yeah, I, and I, I like this concept that we're all talking about about mentoring and and reaching out and um, you know I think it's partly professional growth and it's partly you know having somebody you can talk to right whether it's I had to pump in the basement of, of, a, of a building downtown. Right? <laughs> um, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not a hundred percent work or being taken seriously at work. I mean, sometimes there's other things that I think having um, strong females in the, in the workplace in the community in the agile community, the lean common community that you can talk to um, when things are going well and when things aren't going well, or if you, you have a shitty, you, you're sitting, your <laughs> talk doesn't go very well. Right. I want to sit down yeah. with somebody and be like, I don't know what I just did. Can you help me? Um, so I think yeah. some of it's helping mentor, but it's also creating really great relationships with all the strong, smart women in this, in this community we're in. Yeah. And there are a lot of us. Yeah. There are a ton. So I, I think that's, that's a good point. So, there are a lot of you. So I know that um, this has been extremely educational for me. Um, it, would there be an interest in continuing this conversation um, as a series, you know, to, to blossom this, to get more sort of information and inter interaction out there? Could this be a good vehicle to do that? Um, you know, whether it be via podcasting or online communities, you know, are there, do, you, do you see more of this? as being a benefit or is there yeah, absolutely more i mean yeah andrew there there is there is a women in agile um slack group out there um that i think emerged out of a couple of years of different um groupings being convened and i know it's i know this group in particular i i believe um natalie warnard and lisa atkins got together and kind of formed this grouping, but I'm not sure. I mean, there are a whole bunch of little autonomous groups 
mentoring and, and doing things in their communities and feeding back into this larger group to share information and share articles. So there is a Slack group out there um, and I can, you know, get the information and we can put it on Agile Uprising site um, for those who are interested. But there is a growing community. Um, I think it's, it, though I do think it has to be more than just, you know, a Slack group and a place to talk, but what are we actively doing? Like Lisa said with Speakeasy and like Janice's experiment that she wants to do, we, we maybe need a place to, a sounding board, a place to post those opportunities or to share those opportunities widely to continue to communicate so little pockets can merge into larger, you know, groupings. But I do think it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, that That's, yeah, I mean, that that's great. I, I'm, as I said, this is extremely educational for me. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate the information. <laughs> um, so I, I know we're coming up on the hour here, so I, I, I don't want to, necessarily time box anyone out from saying anything, but I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to to possibly, if you're speaking at any engagements or you want to sort of open up and, and provide any information about yourself where people can find you, follow you, um, and so forth, I, I definitely want to allow that opportunity before we sort of wrap things up. But I also would like to, to welcome you back to do this again. Um, I think an hour to sort of cover such a broad topic isn't quite enough, but I, I'm not sure anyone can quite go on to listen to a podcast for four hours. So, you know, <laughs> I, I would love to see this continue. If there's an appetite to continue, I would love to, to see this conversation continue. So um, don't necessarily need an answer or anything. So I'm going to go ahead and just sort of go around the horn. And, and Lisa, do, is there anything that you have coming up? Are you speaking anywhere or anything you want to sort of promote or throw your Twitter out there for people to follow you? Uh, thanks. I'm Lisa, I'm Lisa Crispin on Twitter and most social media, and LisaCrispin.com is my website. And if you're interested, you know, if you're a, thinking about speaking at a conference, I would love to help you with your proposal, whatever. I Like I say, I pair with a lot of people to present. Um, I am going, my next conference is, is Agile Testing Days in Potsdam, Germany. And I really love these conference organizers because they work so hard to get more women speaking at the conference and more women attending the conference and not just women, other, you know, all, all the minorities, all the diversity. And so I really, you know, we need to support the conferences that are doing this. We need to spend our time and money helping the organizers that are trying to help our community. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but yes, I'm always, I love hearing from everybody and I love these discussions and hearing these different viewpoints and I've learned a lot doing this so thank you very much thanks lisa thank thank you again for your participation so this is good so janice do you want to go ahead and um you have anything you want to plug or promote uh let's see uh, i've got the lean Canada north america conference for 2017 uh that website is up and looking for speakers so people can go on the website and um, uh, apply if they want to and uh, I do not uh, discriminate men <laughs> versus women but I encourage mm -hmm. anyone to apply to speak we're always looking for new voices um, and uh, I think the next place I'm speaking is the Kanban leadership retreat in Dubai in uh, January um, so anyone uh, wanting to get into the more advanced topics, um, do check out the Kanban Leadership Retreat. It's sort of an open space. Great, thanks. That's Dubai. We could go off on a topic on that all on our own. Um, yeah. So, uh, Becky, how about you? Um, so I'm on Twitter uh, at, at Beck, B-E-C-K-S-P-M. Um, and other than that, I, I have yet to have my first conference speaking experience. I've done several locally and look to continue that. So I'll get back to you on that. Hopefully soon in the next year, I'll have a couple of venues to talk about. Um, and I've really just, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think we've had um, a rich kind of um, pocket of information and, and different but blended ideas and statements and ways to look at things. So I'm I'm definitely glad I got to participate in this. Great. Thank you. And Colleen? Yeah, um, I can be found on Twitter 
under Scrum Hive. Um, I have a couple of speaking engagements coming up at the uh, Silicon Valley Agile Leadership Network meetup in December, um, the Tri-Valley uh, East Bay Agile Leadership Network meetup in March, and then an Agile and Beyond conference in Ann Arbor, Michigan in May. All three of those topics will be on um, scaling Kanban to the enterprise. And, um, I, you know, I agree with Becky. I think one of the things that's so interesting in participating in these conversations in different areas of our business and, and our, of our lives is that everybody does have a very different take on what they've seen and what they want to see happen next. Um, whether, you know, whether it's as a parent, as a sister, as a, as a daughter of somebody, right? We've all got a different lens that we're viewing these experiences through. So I think it's always really eye-opening to hear everybody's, um, what everybody wants to see happen next. So I really appreciate the conversation as well, and I'd love to keep it going in the future. Yeah, so speaking of that, you can, we'll be publishing this um, podcast out on Agile Uprising, and, and hopefully everyone is a member of the coalition so we can continue to collaborate as a community and, and sort of hopefully drive home that message around value and, and, and values, you know, being human as opposed to uh, anything else. Um, so again, I just want to thank you again for all your participation and, and I, I've taken a lot of notes. So if we do want to continue this conversation, it would be great to sort of tailor the next convert or the next podcast around some of the, information that you guys have provided and we can sort of go down a different path um, or de a more detailed path. So it was interesting keeping the open conversation and just seeing where it would go. So again, I thank everyone for being open and honest and just having a good conversation. So I appreciate your time and um, thank you. <laughs>